All right. So now what we're going to do is you've seen all the basics. You've seen the kinds of floors. You've, you've, you've kind of understood how to improve the quality of maida by adding gluten, vital wheat gluten, uh, what salt does, what sugar does, what milk and yogurt and fats do in the context of making a dough. So now let's kind of understand in what situation do you use what? Okay. So let's start with, uh, let's start with maida. Okay. Let's assume you have maida and you've added salt, which is one or 2% salt. Um, and you've added yeast also. You've worked in the, you've added the powdered yeast into the, into the, uh, this thing, right? So this is, uh, so this is where you are right now. So now if you add 65% water, okay, 65% of the weight of maida, that much amount of water, right? You have a dough that is ready for focaccia, ciabatta, pizza, and things like that, right? Now, um, some qualifications here. So the assumption here, so you're going to add the water, you're going to knead it, and you're going to let it rise till it doubles. Uh, and then you're going to deflate it, uh, and then stretch it into whatever shape you want. Focaccia is a flat, ciabatta is like a very rough looking bread loaf, pizza is like a flat. So just, you know, there's just some standard uh, shapes into which you want. So beyond the uh, adding the water, letting it rise, then you need to shape it. And after you shape it, you're going to have to let it rise for a second time so that you know that the yeast is still alive and, you know, you can get the right shape you want. Then about half an hour later, you're going to put it in the oven. So that's the general workflow. So that's implicit in any one of these things. So Maida salt yeast, 65% water, you can make focaccia, ciabatta, pizza, any of these things, right? Um, if you add semolina to this, while you're doing this water, you also add a little bit of maybe a teaspoon or tablespoon of semolina, which is rava. Uh, that's the dough you can use for batura. Right? Now, incidentally, you can make batura with, uh, with baking soda, which is usually what restaurants use because nobody's spending two hours trying to use yeast and make it rice and all of that. They use baking soda. So that's essentially how restaurants do it. Uh, but batura made with yeast as it's traditionally used to be made before baking soda came along, is tremendously way more delicious than batura made with baking soda. Ton more flavor. Okay, uh, So the semolina here actually plays a very interesting role. So what semolina does? Semolina, if you notice, um, is, is sort of a very tiny, uh, very dry, uh, has very little moisture inside it. Right? So what happens is that the dough is wet. Uh, the semolina mixed into that is still reasonably dry inside. And it's only at a high enough temperature that the moisture inside the semolina is going to turn into vapor, at which point it will expand. In fact, that's how you absolutely guarantee that either a puri or a batura or luchi or whatever it is you're making actually puffs up. Okay? Because you want the, the rava or the semolina to give up its water only when you're deep frying, at which point the water vapor then fills up. Uh, that So you get an absolute guaranteed puffing up. So if you're worried about puris never puffing up, adding a little bit of semolina to the dough is how you achieve that, right? So this is how you make patura, okay? Now let's switch to another kind, right? So let's say you use only 50% water, but use 15% yogurt, right? You know, we spoke about how yogurt also is mostly water, right? Um, so if you use this kind, still gets to about 65% hydration, but 50% uh, water, 15% yogurt, uh, you can actually make naan, kulcha, kamiri roti. This is the dough that is typically used, right? Um, the, the yogurt adds a little bit of uh, sourness. It adds a little bit of uh, softness and so on. And again, if you're using yogurt uh, and sometimes if you don't want to use yeast, you can simply use baking soda, uh, and which is how restaurants make uh, naan and so on, which is mostly just, it's not as airy if you notice, right? So it's more chewy rather than uh, a genuinely fluffy yeast-based naan, which is strangely enough, not as common in India, but pretty common, say, in the, uh, in the Northwest part of, say, Pakistan or in, in United Kingdom and, and in the US, where they tend to prefer not the chewy kind of naans, but really the fluffy yeasted kind of naans, right? So this is so this is how you make uh, naans and so on. The distinction between kulcha, naans, etc., is very, very tiny. It may have to do with slightly less water. Uh, uh, naans can have a little bit more enrichment in terms of sometimes you might add, add oil and all that. Bear in mind, you have, none of this is actually meant to give you some kind of notion of authentic uh, recipe. This is meant to be a cheat sheet for you so you can get started. And with just one set of standard set of heuristics, you can make like 15 kinds of different kinds of bread, right? Then obviously, then you can do your own research, add more things uh, and do all of that. But this is just a starting point, right? So this is, you can you can make non-pulcha, kabiri, roti, and so on, right? Um, 
if you have a dough that's made from 40% water, 25% milk and butter, right? So you add like 10% additional butter also. This is the dough that you can make any kind of general purpose bread, like pav, you know, pav bhaji, pav, uh, milk bread uh, or buns, like burger buns and so on, right? So it has a buttery taste um, and it has a little bit, it, it's a little bit sweet because of all the milk sugars. Uh, and uh, it is it is also uh, super super soft, right? Because of all the butter, right? because of all the fats, right? So this is uh, so these are in some sense, you know, rather than search for like a million recipes, just remember these things. Roughly, you're aiming for between sixty to sixty five percent water, right? Either it's just water, or it's a mix of water and yogurt, or it's a mix of water, milk, butter, and things like that, right? And based on what you do, you could make pav milk bread. The rest of it is that you you let the dough rise. You really knead it well. You let it rise, and then after that, you shape it into whatever you want. So if you're making pav, it means that you got to use a dough cutter and cut it into small pieces, like thirty or forty grams, and then sort of uh, you know shape it into small balls and let it rise again, uh, so that then you bake it. So that's how you get pav. And so on. So maybe I'll link to some videos of me making pav, so you can kind of get a sense of this, right? Uh, so this is the whole maida maida leavened. Uh, uh, breads uh, algorithm, right? Now, uh, let's say you are actually you don't want yeast, right? So you just want to make uh, unleavened uh, breads, right? So just you just maida salt. If you add fifty five percent water, salt, semolina, sugar, uh, and work in ten percent oil, right, into the dough, oil into the dough, right? You get a dough that's perfect for some what Bengali is called luchi, which is uh, which is this uh, maida based puri, which is you know, flaky, uh, really, really soft and uh, perfect as a breakfast with, you know, alu sabji uh, and so on, you know, fantastic dish in the streets of uh, Calcutta, right? Now, it's, instead of oil, if you add 10% butter, you get a dough that is perfect for parota, right? your malabar parota. Now, how you make a parota is something so, you know, by, so my subsequent uh, uh, mint column will have a uh, instructions on actually how to do this. So, so you need to roll it out and cut it into small strips, apply butter on it, you know, then assemble it all and then roll it uh, very gently uh, and then make the malabar parota. So, so, but then this is how, this is the dough that you need to make, right? Again, same thing, the semolina adds that uh, crispness. It also adds a little bit of airiness uh, while, uh, you know, so this, you can, you can just standardize this dough for, uh, for, you know, malabar style parota, lach, lachate parota as well as the, uh, the luchi, right? Now, the last one is obviously if you have atta, right? So atta, please do not bake with atta. It's a terrible. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you're like super health conscious uh, and you're someone who bakes daily, yeah, then you can mix, you know, uh, thirty percent atta and seventy percent maida. Anything more than that will be will result in very sad and disappointing bread. So in your general dough, don't use more than thirty percent atta if you're actually baking. But if you're making parathas or rotis, you know, this is exactly what you use. So atta is a slightly thirstier flow. So a thirstier flow essentially needs more water, right? So it needs uh, between 80 to 100 percent water, depending on how comfortable you are and what brand of atta it is, how much fibrous it is. Uh, so that's why I said I can't give you a perfect number, but anywhere between 80 to 100 is and by weight, right? So please don't put two cups of atta and two cups of water. You'll end with slush. Okay? It's uh, a cup of water weighs twice as much as a cup of atta. So two cups of water to one cup of water is general rule of thumb. But if you do it by weight, you'll find that it's about you know double, right? So that's the general idea of uh, 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 how you measure for water, right? And if you're using a very very organic high fiber variety and so on, uh, it's going to need more water. Uh, if you use a slightly cheaper, uh, more mass market one, it'll need a little bit less water. And by the way, it'll also need less water depending on the humidity. In your house, that time at that uh, point of time, and also uh, how old the floor is, and so on. So a ton of other things that factor that go into. But trust your feel; it should feel like a pliable, smooth dough. So that's the general idea. Okay? So this is how you make chapatis, you know, with this, right? Uh, now bear in mind that there are many ways to make a chapati soft, um, and it's also there's also personal taste. Uh, for example, I like my chapati slightly chewier, not like ultra flaky and thin. Uh, so it, it varies, right? So if you want ultra flaky, like break apart in your hands uh, kind of uh, texture, then uh, you use hot water as opposed to regular room temperature water. What hot water will do, it will cook the starches, some of the starches, it will gelatinize the starches. That then gives you an ultra flaky uh, soft texture as well. So, so, this is, so this is that, right? Uh, if you however use 80% water and use some oil, right? So you get what's called a paratha. So it can vary between 60 to 80%. 
you get a paratha dough. It needs to be slightly harder uh, than uh, chapati. Um, and uh, so this is what you make paratha as well, right? Uh, not parota, paratha, right? Um, and then if you use 55% water and a lot more oil, you get puri. Very similar to luchi, except without the. And by the way, also I forgot about it. You might want to add a little bit of semolina here. Uh, I think it uh, will definitely improve the puffability of your puri and so on. Right. So this is the general purpose algorithm for really being able to bake any kind of thing. Right. Now, um, so let's kind of summarize the broad principles before we get into Q and A. Okay. Uh, so let me summarize all the principles here. So first thing is flour. Right. Flour is bread flour is best. If you don't want to spend 450 rupees a kg for bread flour, please use maida plus vital wheat gluten. Atta is the worst for baking. Okay. Uh, so if you're using atta, use 30% atta, 70% maida of some kind, right? Uh, so that's that's the general principles around flour. Okay. Um, hydration, right? So general rule of thumb, more water, better bread. Okay. Uh, because you know the idea is that anyway, in the oven at 200 Celsius, all the water is going to boil off anyway. So you just need uh, enough uh, uh, to be able to uh, have enough water there so that the, the bread gets brown and the, the, the insides are still soft, right? You don't want the insides to get rock hard while the outer, you know, the outside is still not brown yet, right? Um, as I said, you can replace or enrich water with milk yogurt for softer breads and so on, right? By the way, you can mix and match, right? So nothing's stopping you from making naan with milk, right? Or naan with yogurt uh, or or anything else, right? So, it, or a paratha with yogurt. It's not uncommon for people to use yogurt in their paratha dough as well, right? Uh, so, next thing is obviously yeast. If you're using industrial yeast, that's fast. If you're using a sourdough starter, it's going to be slow. So, you might want to plan for it appropriately. Um, and sourdough based doughs are better off with more water. Uh, they are tremendously painful to handle. So, you might want to get used to that. So, the other important thing is that as you are kneading, you will find that it's quite frustrating. It's sticky and it's not coming together and so on. When it's not coming together, when in doubt, just give it a break. So the single biggest magic when it comes to baking, the most amazing you know, uh, help you have out there is time. Time improves flavor, time improves gluten structures. You don't have to do anything. Let time do all the work for you, right? So resting the dough is absolutely useful. So it's, you know, you're, you're trying to knead it, start coming to leave it for 15 minutes to 30 minutes, come back, cover it, come back, and then knead again, you will find that it really just uh, uh, works much better, right? Likewise, fermentation also. The longer you ferment, the better. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Kneading, right? So if you're dealing with very, very wet doughs, it's generally better to let it rest. So autolysis in the sense that you just let the dough rest with water and flour, uh, and you just gently stretch and fold many times over several hours. Okay? You can do this at room temperature, right? Or then you do it at room temperature, put it in the fridge, then bring it back and do it, uh, you know, depending on how hot it is. Right? Um, or if you want to hand knead, knock yourself out. Uh, great exercise, 15 to 30 minutes uh, to get it. In my experience, if you're using bread flour, uh, the kneading time is significantly reduced. If you're using maida, uh, you got to knead quite a lot to develop that amount of gluten, given that it has less protein. Right? But if you're using machine, like a, a, a dough maker or a, or, a, or a food processor attachment, or a dough hook and so on, or a stand mixer if you're really posh and so on. Uh, you don't overdo it. Don't do it for more than 10 minutes. Then do the final stage by hand because you have you run the risk of over overworking and over kneading the gluten. So that's the sense as well, right? The next uh, rule to keep in mind is that the slower and longer the fermentation, the better. This is often a problem in place hot places like Chennai where uh, the fermentation is so fast uh, that it doubles in, uh, so the yeast has not had enough time to build a lot more complex flavor, right? So often what we would do is that just refrigerate, right? So seal the dough properly, put it in that glass vessel, refrigerate it. Eight hours later, the dough will still rise uh, at that temperature you have in the fridge, but it will do it very slowly. That way you develop a lot more complex flavor. In fact, if you're making pizzas, right? It's not uncommon for you to just, you know, uh, make a very, very wet and sticky dough don't need do nothing just shove it in the fridge let it sit for 48 hours right and then you'll get amazing pizza right all the gluten development will happen inside okay. um, and then uh, so so that's that's basically the thing so the longer slower longer better flavor right you can do this for naan too actually so if you if you make the dough today refrigerate it and let it rise and then make the naan tomorrow it'll be much much more uh, tastier as well right now coming to the principles of rising right focus on volume not time right so the first rice 
is to aerate the dough. So the yeast will produce the carbon dioxide, the dough will get you know, fluffy and so on. And then you have to deflate it. When you're deflating it, you're only deflating the large air bubbles. And the dough is still aerated for most part, right? And then you shape it, right? After you deflate it, you shape it into the shape you want. Now, let's really go through it. If you're trying to make a focaccia bread, you don't have to do anything, no shaping, right? All you have to do is deflate after the first rice, stretch it on this big flat pan, and let it sit for 30 minutes, then poke some holes, pour some olive oil or flavored olive oil on top and bake for 30 minutes uh, for uh, at whatever temperature, at the highest temperature you have. And you know, you, uh, you're you good to go. Okay. Uh, if you're making a loaf of bread, in which case then you need to shape, you can fold it. Uh, you'll have to, you, you can look at YouTube videos on how to fold a, a, a dough so that it forms the shape of a bread loaf. Okay. And again, uh, you'll have to make sure that you have the right size of so which is why precision is important largely again only because you have uh, this uh, a loaf will hold dough of a certain dimension and size um, and so uh, if you're buying an eight into five kind of loaf, you you need to know that you need about five to six hundred or sorry six hundred to eight hundred grams of dough right so appropriately 500 grams of water 500 grams of flour and 300 grams of water uh, and so on right uh, and so so you, you need to understand based on what uh, what kind of, but if you're not making like sandwich loaves, you're just making these very misshapen, broadly loose, just focaccia, ciabatta type breads, then you don't need to worry. You know, just make whatever you want, right? Uh, so then comes to enrichment, right? So if you want, uh, you want your bread to taste, be flaky and soft, you need fats, you add fats. How much you'll kind of figure out, right? 10% is a good starting point, but uh, yeah, you'll figure it out. Then you can also use hot water and gelatinize the starch so that you get a a soft and fluffy texture. If you don't want to use hot water directly into the dough because it makes it hard to knead, you can take a little bit of flour and heat it in water so that it forms a roux where the, the, the starch gelatinizes, it becomes the sticky thing, then you add that back, right? So that's one way of adding this as well. There are a couple of other things uh, which I didn't want to spend too much time on. There are other add-ons like diastatic malt powder, which is, uh, which is basically made from sprouted grains. So it has the digestive enzyme called amylase, right? So amylase is the enzyme that breaks down amylose, which is the starch, right? So diastatic malt powder, what it does is that it really accelerates yeast activity because um, it, it the amylase will break down the starches into sugar so that yeast can you know act much faster. So faster, stronger rice essentially means you'll get better browning. Uh, when you're actually putting the bread in the oven, right? So professional bakers will use diastatic malt powder. In fact, uh, uh, if you've seen bagels, not very common in India, but at least so you get that even golden brown color that's completely smooth. They do that by adding diastatic malt powder to the dough, right? So, so that's essentially a couple of other things that you can keep in mind. Um, and shaping, right? So uh, the most frustrating thing for any beginner baker is uh, dealing with the dough and shaping the dough if it's ultra sticky, right? Rather counterintuitively, the wetter your hands are, it will prevent stickiness. You remember the principle of how gluten works, right? All the water loving parts are inside, the water hating parts of gluten are actually on the outside. Okay? So if your hands are mildly wet, the dough is less likely to stick to your hand, which seems counterintuitive, uh, but that's it. So you just dip your fingers in a little bit of water when you work the dough. Uh, so that, you know, uh, it's easier. But if you press it too hard, then you're introducing more water into the dough. Gent if you're generally gently folding, it's better for your hands to be uh, slightly uh, uh, wet, right? Avoid using extra flour. In the beginning, you know, you'll be tempted to use flour for dusting, right? All this raw flour is going to burn in the oven, right? It's just direct powder, no water. It's going to burn and add accurate taste, right? So the lesser dusting flour you use, the better. And you'll, you'll get better with practice, right? And don't worry about shape, right? Misshapen breads are equally delicious. Okay? Your most misshapen bread will still be tastier than the fanciest looking industrial loaf uh, from a shop. Okay? Right? And we spoke about the differences between air fryer, OTG, convection oven. They're, they're all operating on the same principle. Air fryer is really small. OTG is slightly bigger and convection is the larger one. Uh, so if you want even browning, uh, before you put it in the oven, it's common to uh, either uh, apply some milk on top of the bread because the milk, again, uh, because it has proteins and sugars, will add to the Maillard reaction when the oven is baking. So you'll get a nice even brown color. Uh, otherwise, you know, you'll only get brown where there are more sugars and proteins on the surface. So this allows you to do that. You can also uh, do this with egg, 
right? You just add some egg wash. So it's just, you know, break open an egg and just apply it on top. You get a very glaze. You get that very shiny surface. That's, you do that, you get that with, uh, you get that with an egg wash. So, uh, so you can use both. So this, this is before you put the, uh, the bread in the oven, right? When you're baking, trust your nose and eyes and nose, not the amount of time and the temperature that is given in the recipe, right? You'll know when the bread is done. It will look brown enough. Uh, and remember that don't get, especially when you're baking like loaves of bread, the outer crust can get pretty, pretty dark. Don't worry about it, right? Uh, if you kind of stop when it's still very light brown, insides won't be cooked. And, you know, you, you'll, you'll figure it out, right? Um, and not only that, other thing is that the, if you spray a little bit of water or keep a small little tray of water in your oven, that will improve the rice. Uh, again, simply because what happens is that what's happening is that uh, the dough is rising a little bit in the oven as temperatures are getting really, really hot, right? But the outer surface is getting assaulted by a high temperature air, right? So it's going to dehydrate and lose water. So at some point of time, the outer crust is not going to be elastic anymore, right? So at that point, no further air can expand because it's not elastic anymore. So what steam does is that the steam keeps the outer surface wet for long enough so that all the air can expand inside and achieve its full potential for the largest loaf you can bake before the, all the water boils off and then it, uh, you know, it becomes uh, really perfectly brown. Right? So that's why, you know, so some steam ovens naturally have a steam setting, but you can just spray some water inside and so on. So this is the... This is, this is what it is, right? Uh, and then last but not the least, please wait for the bread to reach room temperature before digging it, right? So otherwise, uh, it, will, uh, um, it will be uncooked, right? And so you, you want to you wanna wait for that to finish, right? So with that, let's do Q&A. Uh, so go bake some delicious bread and uh, please pre-order my book on Amazon. Thank you.